Good morning, Parkway. Who's got joy to be in the Lord's house this morning? Who's got joy to be in the Lord's house this morning? Come on, let's lift him up. Let's worship him today. the Lord for the joy in the house today. I was standing there and, and just worshiping and thinking about that song, Joy in the House today. Where does that joy come from? It comes from being reminded where, you, where it could have been, where I was, and where the Lord has brought me to now. It comes when I remember the goodness of the Lord and His mercies that endure forever. 
it comes as I lift up my heart and rejoice because the Lord is good. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm so glad to be in the house of the Lord today with my family. Amen. Because that's what we are. We're the family of the Lord. We're here glorifying and magnifying Him. We're here lifting up His name. And uh, I guess it's time for the lights to come on because uh, we're going to take just a few moments to get out of our seat and greet the rest of our family that, that we haven't been able to greet yet and welcome them into the house of the Lord today. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Pastor gets to do an enviable job as far as most pastors are concerned. It's a job that we loved as pastors, and that's bringing people into the church, welcome them into membership in their local body. Because they were making a commitment saying, I want to be part of this. I want to, I want to throw myself into this and, and uh, work with you all. So, uh, Pastor Mark, the uh, house is going to come at this time. Thank you, Brother David. Give the Lord thanks this morning. Amen. All right, we've got uh, a couple of folks, Philip and uh, Brianna, I know, or uh, Adrian, I'm sorry. I don't know where who Brianna is, but whoever she is. Come on, Adrian. Come on, Philip. Yeah, if y'all just stand facing the congregation. Uh, by the way, I, I just heard bits and pieces. I, I was out of town with some other 
ministry things this weekend. By the way, we got uh, Chuck and Danielle graduated from their internship this week. So we're this weekend. So we're proud of them. Thankful for what God's doing in their lives. Uh, but I caught a few bits and pieces. I know we had a group uh, over in Letcher County ministering this weekend, and I understand had a great a great weekend. So we're thankful for that and the ministry taking place there. It's always important to me that people understand, and sometimes they don't understand if you don't explain it. Joining a church does not save you. It's faith in Jesus that saves you. <clears throat> However, joining a church is biblical. Paul goes to great lengths in his writing to communicate this idea that, it, that being a Christian, we do not do this by ourselves, but we do it together. Being a part of a body, joining something, being accountable, walking this thing out together, all of that is real biblical stuff because we need each other. Especially in American culture where we emphasize the individual almost exclusively, we lose this idea that we need each other. Going to heaven, I got to put faith in Jesus for myself, but it's going to be a whole lot easier and a whole lot better if I've got some brothers and sisters to help me along the way. Amen. So today we come, and there are just three or four basic questions that I'm going to ask today that kind of covers it. We're thankful for Philip and what we've seen God do in his life and what God is doing. God's still in the life-changing business, amen? And we're thankful for Adrian and her family. Uh, we, amen. The other day we were downtown planting flowers, serving the city, and she was with us, and I don't know that the city or the city leaders know it, but there are prayer cloths all up and down Main Street praying for this city. Have you accepted, this is the main question, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Secondly, do you promise to the best of your ability, both with your attendance and support in that way, as well as with material things and financial things and in every way you can to the best of your ability to be faithful to the church and to the Lord. Thirdly, do you promise to submit yourself to your pastor and to the spiritual leaders and authority that God sets over you? Amen. Those are the main things. And we're going to pray and welcome you guys as new members officially in this body because you're making a pledge to us and we're making a pledge to you. Now, I take it real seriously because when, once you officially, you know, whosoever will is welcome to come. But once you officially join, you become a reflection of this house. And that matters. And... Uh, you support us, and we support you, and we do this thing together. Amen? Reach your hand this way. Jennifer, come help me pray. In fact, why don't you just lead us in prayer for these folks? Lord, we thank you so much. God, the Word says that you set us in families. And God, I know that may be biological, but Lord, I also believe you set us in church families and in spiritual families. And God, today, I just pray a prayer of blessing over Adrian and her beautiful children. God, they are a blessing to this church, and I thank you for them. And God, let them know 
nothing else, God. If there's nothing else, God, just let them know that they are accepted here, that they are loved here, and that they are family. Lord, there is significance in that. They are part of a family, no longer alone, but part of a family. I thank you for them today. God, I thank you for Philip. God, he's been through a lot to get to this place. But Lord, you have brought him into a house that will love him through hurt, that will love him through trials, and that will love him through mistakes. God, we are a, we're, Lord, we are an, we're an imperfect people serving a perfect God. And Lord, we draw our strength from you. And I thank you, God that he is locking arms with our church. I pray, God, that you would use him and be close to him and be with him. And, Lord, as a church, we thank you for Adrian, her children, and for Philip, God. We thank you that you saw fit to bless us with them. Now, God, let us minister to them. Let us be family to them. Let us be there for them. Let them know that Parkway Ministries is their family in Jesus' name. Amen. Give them a good hand. God bless you guys. You be sure you get to them and let them know we love them today. Praise the Lord again. It's an opportunity that I get to worship the Lord in giving. It's an opportunity that brings a blessing into my life. Just the last little bit, uh, I, and it may be because I just celebrated a birthday, and you know, the white hair is well earned. <laughs> but uh, I got to, I've just been looking back and just thinking how good the Lord has been to me. He's been faithful. And I look, you know, what He asks us to do is be faithful to Him in return. He's going to be faithful to us. And I have seen the blessings of the Lord. Sometimes as pastors, we get accused of of being all about the money. But one of the things I found is when you Billfold gets saved, God's able to bless you. And uh, I found that when you give to the Lord, you can't outgive Him. A few years ago, I was pastoring in London and we needed to add on to the church. And I asked the people, I said, now, we've got to do it cash. We, don't, we can't borrow any money. We've got to do it cash. And we <laughs> didn't have enough coming in to just, but just barely to pay the bills. And I said, if you will pay a double tithe on unexpected income for the next year, we'll see what the Lord will do. Anyone that will agree with me. I said, now, if you regularly work overtime on a, on a regular basis, that's not, that's not what I'm talking about. It's just anything that comes in above and beyond. And people looked at me and said, okay, Pastor. And in the next year, God blessed abundantly. I had one lady who's, uh, you know, her mother was, was sick at the beginning and she passed away during that time. And she thought that she was going to have to pay for her mother's funeral because her mother didn't have anything. And so they, she was the only uh, child and so she started working on the estate. She went into her mother's house and got to looking, her mother had a bunch of old lamps in the house. And she got to looking at one of them and said, that lamp looks like that might be valuable. So she took it to somebody and they said, that's a Tiffany lamp. She said, oh, wow. She ended up with like six or seven Tiffany lamps out of her mother's house. She ended up with $48,000 that she got out of her mother's estate that she thought there was nothing that was there. She was going to have to pay the funeral bills. She came to me, she said, Pastor, I will gladly pay a double tithe. (laughs) I had people from everywhere that were being blessed of the Lord. You see, when you're faithful to God, He is faithful to you. David said he had never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. Why is that? Because they're being faithful to God. 
So all we're asking you to do today is be faithful in what God has blessed you with. And as you're faithful to him, he, will, he in return will bless you back. When my ushers come, get ready. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Father, as we come, we come to a loving, heavenly Father. A Father who knows how to treat his children right. (laughs) And Lord, I, I thank you for my earthly father that was a good earthly father, knew how to treat me right and taught me how to treat my children right. Lord, I, I, I thank you for that. But Lord, I thank you that you know how to treat us so well that we can contain the blessing, Lord. And the joy comes because, Lord, we're overjoyed by what comes our way. How amazing it is, oh Lord, that we just sit back and are reminded of your goodness to us. Now, Lord, just help us to be faithful in the small things. But Lord, when we're faithful in a few things, Lord, that's going to make a great difference. And Lord, as we're faithful together, that adds up a little bit and becomes a little bit more and a little bit more becomes a little bit more. And finally, it's a massive amount. Lord, that's what we're asking you for. Let us give our little bit to that. Lord, it becomes a little bit more with somebody else's and a little bit more so that it is enough to take care of every situation we come in contact with here. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you.
the stronger the pain, the stronger my faith grows, the higher the need, the higher I'll reach, the greater the
Jesus that he who came in power he's coming again and he who heals the sick won't he move again he who raised the dead won't he raise again I will sing oh I will sing come on some people need to sing their way to their breakthrough this morning Come on, praise the King of kings and the Lord of lords this morning. Lord, we praise you. Hallelujah. Now listen, I want to do that one more time. There is a key there. I don't claim to understand it all, but the Word teaches us that quite often that that's the way it works. When I don't see a thing, before I ever feel anything, In fact, when it may even look quite the opposite, I go ahead and praise Him then. Come on, praise Him. I praise you in advance because my confidence is in you and I'm sure of you. I bless you, Lord. Listen, I I want to do that one more time. There's some folks that have physical stuff and you need a healing. But there are people in here, you got wounds that nobody sees. There are emotional and spiritual and mental things on the inside of you and you don't feel like you can ever get any better and ever get past that. You've been that way so long. You can't remember life before that and you don't think it can ever change. But I'm going to tell you, you can praise Him now and believe Him for the victory. Believe Him that I will not always be this way. Come on, give the Lord praise. God, you heal wounded hearts. You heal troubled souls. You heal troubled minds. And God, I praise you because I know there's coming a day that I won't be like I am right now and that there will be a change. Bless the name of the Lord. Praise God. I want you, I know there are several people around this room that you need, who need a physical healing and you need God to touch you. If you have any kind of 
impossible situation, something like that or whatever it is in your life. Listen, we lay hands on, we do that quite often. But I really believe that there are many times that God wants to just come into the room just to move across His people as His presence fill the room, fills the room as we've worshipped Him. If you, you've got whatever it is that you really need God to touch you, would you just, just lift your hand? Just hold it up there for a minute. Look around, find somebody. If you can reach them, lay hands on them or at least extend your hand towards somebody. And let's pray all around this room today. God, come on, pray with me. Lift your voices. God, we're praying for you to heal to heal bodies, to heal spirits. <clears throat> There's nothing too hard for you. We praise you, Lord. <clears throat> God, we call things that are not as though they were. Come on, pray like you'd want somebody praying for you. God, we believe you for your touch today. And we call it done. Amen. Now give the Lord praise in here this morning. Thank God. Hallelujah. Remain standing with me. Go with me in your Bibles this morning to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19 and verse 10. And I know we put it on the screens for your convenience, but I also encourage you, it's important that you are familiar with your Bible and how to use it. I think the, uh, Brother Larry, aren't the senior adults doing fellowship after service this morning? I just mention those things on occasion because wherever you fit on the spectrum, we want you to plug in and connect because we care about you. Amen? <clears throat> One verse of <clears throat> Scripture. Two weeks ago, I started a, a new series with you on the Jesus you may not know. The Jesus you may not know. And we started by talking about the fact that Jesus is the Jesus of the Old Testament as well as the New. In fact, He is Jesus on every page. And I mentioned to you that there are some facets of Jesus that we'll talk about that maybe are not as familiar to us or we've not as embraced as much. And that was probably the case somewhat with the first week. Well, and I mentioned to you there are also dimensions of Jesus that you have to know in order to know who He is. And that's probably a little, a little more along the line of where we'll be this morning. The Bible said in Luke 19 and 10, For the Son of Man has come to seek. Everybody say to seek. What does seek mean? It means you go looking for it. For the Son of Man has come to seek. Everybody say to seek and to save that which was lost. Why don't you just thank God for that today? Amen. Pray with me. Lord, we thank you for this moment as we stand before you. 
God, I pray that you would touch hearts. I thank you for every person that's here. God, I pray that you would help us, that people would really know and feel that what we really care about is one life at a time. God, that every individual, there are people here, Lord, that feel so unworthy, so cheap, so dirty. God, feel like they're the maybe the least one in the room. And God, I pray that you would touch hearts today and you'd cause us to know how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. That as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is your love toward us. And God, I pray that you'd touch every heart and cause them to know today no matter where they've been, what they've done, where they come from, what's been done to them, that, Lord, you came looking for them, just for them. God, I pray that you draw hearts to you today, and we give you the praise, the honor, and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless the Lord with me in this room this morning. God bless you, and you may be seated. I've told you I'm preaching a lot right now about Jesus. More than ever, and I mean this, I've been preaching since I was a kid and certainly tried to be true to the gospel and sound and solid, but more than ever before in my life right now, I just want to meet Jesus. I just want to preach Jesus. And I'm meeting him in a personally And that continues in a fresh and new way, fresh encounter, in ways that I've never known him before. And we've made it real complicated, but folks, we need need revival, but we need a revival of the proclamation and the presentation of Jesus. We just need people. We've made it real complicated. The world isn't interested in our religion. They just need Jesus. They just want Jesus. And I just want to preach Jesus more than ever before in my life. And he's become so real to me. I've known him since I was a kid. But he's become so real to me. The reason that I'm carrying this Bible, preaching out of this Bible, and carrying this Bible to the pulpit right now is because I got this Bible at the garden tomb. Just within a few feet of Golgotha of where Jesus was crucified and there at the garden tomb where he was resurrected. I, right now I'm, I, I'm wearing a, a stone around my neck a big part of the time from the Sea of Galilee. Not that there's anything magical about those things, but just as points of contact and reminder to me, folks, when we have an encounter with Jesus, that'll take care of everything. Everything that we've made so complicated When we meet Jesus, that'll take care of it. Amen. Now, I talked to you the first week about Jesus. He's he's Jesus on every page. He's Jesus of the Old Testament as well as the New. Today, I want to talk to you about the fact that Jesus is the seeker. Jesus is the seeker. Everybody say seeker. Everybody say seeker. It is foundational to understanding who he is. If Jesus had a mission statement, a mission statement that's popular today in the business world and leadership circles, we talk about a mission statement. If Jesus had a mission statement, Luke 19 and 10 is it. The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. That's the reason that he came. That's the reason for his existence. And if we're going to have, if we're going to understand him, we have to understand that. And I know that certainly applies in salvation. But I'm glad, even after I know him, he still he wants fellowship and relationship with me, and he comes looking for me. In fact, we used to sing a song. 
God's voice speaking to us said, I, I miss my time with you. Did you know prayer is not just a guilt trip? It, it's not just God putting us on a guilt trip. It, it, it's not as much that he feels bad at us as he feels bad for us. When, when we don't spend time with us, he'll, he'll come looking for you. He, he wants your company. He desires you. It's at the essence of who he is. But particularly in the salvation story, it would have been enough if I could, if, if somehow we could have just kind of, if you're anything like me, if I ever got anywhere, it's not because I knew what I was doing. It's because I stumbled my way into it. Amen. And it would have been enough if I just kind of somehow stumbled my way into God and he was there and, and, and available. I, I wouldn't have even been worthy of that if I could have just somehow stumbled my way in and found him. But how many of you know most of us, if it had been up to us, we'd have never found him. I said we'd have never found him on our own. He came for us. <clears throat> I came across a story the other day. There was a woman... Her name was Tiffany, and she got to work that morning, and she was starting her day, and she reached, and, and women will do this. I've seen my wife do it many times. Reach for those, those wedding rings to adjust those rings. And as she was starting her day, she, she reached for her wedding rings, and they weren't there. And she, she got to thinking about it and she realized she didn't know where they were and she lost her, her wedding band her engagement ring and her wedding band and she got to thinking and it dawned on her kind of to her horror the night before she had been preparing in the kitchen preparing a meatloaf for her family and she put it down you know how you do you take taking the wrapper off stuff and you got stuff around the counter and she was sure that her wedding set was in the garbage. And so she called, and it was precious to her, and so she called home. Her mother was watching the children that day and to see if the garbage had run yet. And sure enough, the garbage had just run. And so she was in a panic because she knew her wedding ring was in the garbage. And so she called in her town, the local sanitation department and they were able to either they were very nice I think probably nicer than most folks like that would be because how many of you know sometimes it's just who you get a hold of she happened to get a hold of the right person and so he identified the truck and the route that covered her neighborhood and her house and so he got a hold of them on the truck and had them pull over and just park the truck and leave it. Not many people would do that. But he just, he worked with her and just had him pull over and just leave the truck. And so that evening when she got off work, Tiffany and her husband went to the location and they found the truck and there were five, again, this is kind people, there were five sanitation workers there waiting on them. And for about the next 45 minutes, they went through about nearly 14 tons of, of, of garbage that they're pawing through and, 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 and making their way through and sure enough in the garbage she found her wedding ring and she found the set and she said I, I can't describe to you how overjoyed I was to find that set, that wedding that engagement ring and that wedding band that was precious to me. And I tell that story this morning as a reminder and hopefully something that'll speak to you because the truth is, number one, God found us. But if we're honest, and he went to some effort to find us, but if we're honest, when he found you, he found you in the garbage. You were lost, and when, but when he found you, you, you weren't in a good place. You were in the garbage. And so first of all, we need to be reminded of where he found me. 
that I was lost. I was separated from him. I wasn't anywhere good. Yeah, he found me, but most of us, he went looking through the garbage to find you. He went looking for you in, a pla- in places that most people wouldn't have even cared enough to go looking for you. And we're talking about the Lord of the universe who left the glory of heaven and, and, and left the glory of his kingdom to come to earth and take on a mortal body. When he, fa- he found you all right, thank God, but you can't take it for granted because when he found you, he found you in the garbage. And not only is it a reminder of where he found us, but it's a reminder of how precious that we were to him. Because he didn't have to do that and he didn't have to go looking where he did, but he came looking for us. I would, it would have been enough. I'd have been thankful if some way I could have managed to to. to, to stumble my way into him but the truth is we most of us that that would have never been the case he came looking several years ago the crab family sang a song that was pretty popular at the time he came looking for me he came looking for me anybody glad about that this morning and thankful he came looking for me In recent years, there has been a movement in the church. It's probably waning some now because sometimes we're bad to just chase trends instead of really following the leadership of the Holy Spirit. We're we're bad in the church at times, as bad as anybody to just chase trends and the latest popular thing. And It's probably waning some now because of that. But there's been a movement in the body of Christ called seeker sensitive that we wanted churches and some of them grew to very large numbers and we wanted churches to be seeker sensitive. And basically the thinking about, uh, thinking about that was that we had come to a place and there's some truth in that, that we had come to a place where unfortunately too many times the church had become just about church people. Hello. I said the church had just become about church people and just keeping church people happy and what we liked and what we wanted. And so there's some truth in that, that churches were trying to become more seeker sensitive. In other words, that it was geared to lost people and not just keeping church people happy, but but really and truly reaching people who were far from God and people who were lost and, and, and we needed some of that and there was some good in that. But the bad thing is that we never seem to find a happy medium. The, we, we always tend for the pendulum to swing from one extreme to the other. And unfortunately, there are, have been churches in that movement that in the name of becoming seeker and we, we've been influenced by it in our own stream of faith, but in the name of becoming seeker-sensitive, there are churches that, that became so seeker-sensitive that they compromised the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, most of you know I work across denominational lines. If we can agree on the basics of the, of the gospel, I'll, I'll be happy to put my arm around you, but the fact is, and I don't just mean off somewhere else, I mean here in the Tri-County area, we have churches that have compromised the gospel of Jesus Christ in the name of becoming sensitive to seekers. Because there are, th- there are some things that can change and there are some things that don't change. We're gonna treat you with love and respect no matter who you are, what your lifestyle is, You were made in the image of God, but we also believe that when you come to Jesus, there's going to be a change, that you're not going to just keep living like you used to live and doing what you used to do because you find Jesus and you don't need that stuff anymore. There's a change that's taking place. So there's a balance with some of that stuff because the fact is, I understand 
that many of us have times in our lives when we're searching and we are seekers in that sense. We're looking for something. And many of us can remember those days, but I would tell you today that while there may be some occasions that we're searching and seeking, the real seeker, the one this started with, it, this didn't start with me. This started with him. He was proactive. Because if it had been up to me, some of us were satisfied in our mess. Some of us were satisfied in our filth. We didn't know any better and we thought that was normal. And if it had been to, uh, up to us to figure anything out, we'd have been in trouble a long time ago. He was the one who came seeking. He was the one who came looking. Thank God if I came to myself like the prodigal son in the pig pen, one would have loved to have eaten what the pigs were eating and one day he came to himself and got up and went back to the father's house. Thank God that I came to my senses. But the truth is that when the prodigal started down the road, he saw the father running toward him who was already running in his direction with arms wide open who had already started started looking for him. Somebody praise the name of the Lord. Do you know that's the only picture in the Bible of God running when the father ran with open arms to meet the prodigal son. Now there are a couple of scriptures, give me my scriptures from Romans that remind us of this. The Bible said in Romans 3.11, if it's just up to me, I'm in trouble, said there's none who understands, there's none who seeks after God if I'm just left up to my own devices. But give me the next verse. Romans 5 and 8 said, but God demonstrated his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When I didn't even know enough, knew what I needed. When I didn't even know enough to go looking, to know there was any better way of life. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Praise the name of the Lord. <clears throat> but I didn't even know I needed anything. Can anybody identify with me? There was a time you didn't even know what a mess you were. Look over at somebody and tell them you were a hot mess. <clears throat> he came looking for me. I said he came looking for me. He came looking for me. He was the one who initiated this process. Thank God when I tried everything else and nothing else works. And he drew me by his spirit. And I finally got a moment of lucidity. And I finally started to think straight a little bit and look up and realize I don't have to stay in the mess I'm in. There's a different way to live. See, salvation, it means that God will get you out of the mess and he'll get the mess out of you. Amen. He does both of those things. Now our problem is that quite often we have been so shaped by the world and our thinking, our mindset has been skewed. I couldn't reason my way up to God. That's why revelation matters. He had to reveal himself to me. I couldn't figure him out. Listen. We didn't earn our way up to heaven. That's why Jesus came to earth. That's why Jesus became a man. God came down. It had to be from heaven to earth. It wasn't going to be from earth to heaven. I couldn't bridge the gap. He is the seeker. It's at the essence and the core of who he is. And I want to tell you today, he's looking for you. He's looking for you. But we become so skewed in our thinking and we have, put up my next screen please, we have some common misconceptions about the gospel. This is why we need a seeker. Somebody looking for us. Number one, we don't think we're that bad. Everybody 
Come on, nod your little head, head at me. We have been, we have been so shaped by a religion called humanism. And they would say, oh, that's not a religion. We're just taking God out. No, you want to take my God out and replace it with your own religion. Because at its core level, at its core definition, religion is a belief system. Religion is a belief system. And you don't just want no God. You want to take my, remove my God and replace him with your God. Humanism. We've become so filled, none of us really think we're that bad. We don't, we, 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 we become so, so, t- all of us like to think, well, I, you know, pastor, I think I'm a pretty good person. I think I'm a, I think I'm a, a pretty nice guy. You know, all of us like to think, because we deceive ourselves, and allow the devil to deceive us, deceive us. We, we, we think we're, we're, we're pretty nice people. The Bible said that we were born in sin. In sin, your mother conceived you. You don't have to teach a child how to lie. You have to teach them how to tell the truth. If you've got a field out here and you just let it grow up, I, well, they can do what they, you know, Mike, I don't want to force anything on them. You make them take a bath, you send them to school, you, well, I don't want to force it. You just let a field grow up. I'll tell you what you get is a nice field of weeds. But we don't really, we don't really think we're that bad. Folks, the Bible said Jesus didn't entrust himself to just anybody because he knew what was in a man. There, if I give way to my flesh, we like to think we're pretty nice people. If I give way to my flesh, there's nothing my flesh won't do. I said there's nothing my flesh. We think we're above certain. Well, I'm not like so-and-so. There ain't nothing you're above or too good for if you give way to your flesh. We don't think we're that bad, number two. We think Jesus came to good people who were struggling. Hello? Well, you know, I was just kind of having a hard time. I meant well. God knows my heart, preacher. Y'all need to keep smiling. God knows my heart, preacher. Well, I, you know, he, he knows... He, he knows I'm, yeah, he knows exactly what's in your heart. There's, there's envy and lust and hatred and bitterness and all kind of junk in my heart. My only hope is in Jesus. We act like the gospel is just, you know, God coming to help out people who were struggling and having a hard time. There is a word that describes who and what we were apart from Jesus. Give me my definition here. Reprobate. You know the word reprobate? Reprobate means a depraved, unprincipled, wicked person. A person rejected by God and beyond hope of salvation, morally depraved, bad. Look over at somebody and tell them, you were bad. It means to reject as for sin. Synonyms for reprobate are words like scoundrel and wretch and rascal. You were a rascal. A scoundrel. Listen, I, want, I wouldn't want every event of my life put up on the screen. You wouldn't, would you? Aren't you thankful for the blood of Jesus? The blood of Jesus, it's like that stuff never happened. It's it's like I'd never sinned because there's a change that's made because there was a seeker who came. He came. He left heaven 
and came for me. <clears throat> Give me my third point here, our misconceptions. We think he came to good people who were struggling. We think he came to make us better. I've got news for you. Everybody look at me. Jesus did not come to make us better. He came to make us new. There's a big difference. You were dead in transgressions and sin. You don't need a better version of death. You were dead, you need life. You need a whole new existence. You need him to breathe. I don't just need a better version of my sorry, rotten self. I need the old self to be put away. I need newness of life. I need him to make me a totally new person. Now, you may think this is basic and simple. I'm not apologizing, but sometimes we just need a reminder of the gospel. The basics of the gospel. There was nothing good in me. There was nothing lovely in me. I was in sin. Jesus, he didn't make me better. He made me new. I'm Mark, but I'm a new Mark. There is a different way to live than what you've been experiencing. And God didn't put that stuff on you. We make our own choices. But sometimes he's not going to force you and he'll let, if you're determined to do your own thing, he'll let you keep going until you get to the end of yourself. Sometimes you can't go up until you hit the bottom. Until you've gone as far down, exhausted every opportunity you thought you had, until you hit that point, you can't find him. I don't know about you, but there was ugly stuff in me. There was stuff in me that I'm not proud of. Jesus gives us, give me my next two scriptures. <clears throat> Jesus said in Mark 2, 17, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Give me the next one. Luke 5, 32. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He didn't come for people who were just struggling a little bit. He came for people for whom there was no hope. There was no other way Except him. He came. He came. He came looking for me. Paul describes it in one place. In Romans, that, that old man, he said, are y'all with me? He said, he, he got to a place where he got sick of himself. Did you ever get there? Just sick. Look in the mirror, just makes you sick. He said, Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? You know what he's talking about? Sometimes the Romans, if you were a convicted criminal, especially maybe. You were a murderer, killed somebody. As your sentence, they would take a corpse and tie it to you. And so that every time you moved, 
Paul said, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? He was talking about when the Romans would do that and every time you moved, you had the dead man on your back and you couldn't get away from him. And after a period of days, the corruption of that decaying corpse would begin to eat in your, into your body until finally it killed you because you packed around that old man so long that it finally killed you. Are you hearing me? There are people wearing $500 suits, but they've got a dead man on their back. There are people driving nice cars, but they're going down the road with a dead man on their back. There are people living in nice homes. There are people on TV every day that if you could see in the spirit, they may be on national television, but they got a corpse. They got a dead man on their back that they can't seem to shake and it's eating away at them and the corruption is getting into them more and more and more all the time. There's only one way to be delivered you gotta come to the cross you gotta come to Calvary you gotta let Jesus get rid of the old man so that there is a new and better you somebody praise the name of the Lord (coughs) that's why that's why Jesus said the thief comes to steal kill and destroy He said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. You don't just need to do better. You don't just need to be better. We act like we've turned this gospel into some kind of self-help message. I got, smile again. I got a revelation for you. You can go to the bookstore. They have whole sections, self-help. I don't know about you, baby, But that's my problem is I've been helping myself way too long. That's how I got in this mess. Your wife doesn't need a better husband. She needs a new husband. Your kids don't need better parents. They need new parents. Your boss doesn't need a better employee. He needs a new employee. That when you show up tomorrow, my God, something's happened. What happened to you? I'm not who I used to be. Jesus came and he found me. Let me give you one more passage. Take me to my last passage from Matthew. Now there are two short similar parables here that will be familiar to many of us. John 13 verse 44, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid And for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Now, many of us are familiar with these parables, the treasure hidden in the field, the pearl of great price. And typically, the way that we interpret these parables usually is that we should give, that the kingdom of God is worth giving all we have. That we're the person that finds the pearl of great price or finds the treasure in the field and we sell all that we have to get him. And it's certainly true that he's worth our all and our everything. That's certainly true. But there are a couple of problems with that line of interpretation and there is an alternate, another way to interpret this. He says there was a treasure hidden in a field. And when you look at the parable immediately prior to this, Jesus says the field is the world. And so I'm not looking to the world. If I'm looking for something, I'm not looking to the world for anything. And secondly, this faith is not something I buy. 
So let me give you another interpretation. It is possible to interpret this with the treasure in the field and the pearl of great price. Are you hearing me? That instead of that being me, that it's Jesus. That he's talking about himself. And guess what? You know what the treasure is to him? You. You know what the pearl of great price is to him? You. You may not think you're worth anything. But if that's the way we should interpret this parable, Jesus said, I found a pearl and it was you. And Jesus said, I was willing to give up everything. I gave up heaven. I gave up the glory. I gave up the splendor because he's the seeker and he came looking for you. What if it's not just me looking for the treasure, but what if he thought I was a treasure? What if he thought I was a pearl and I was worth him giving up everything, including his life, and he came looking for me? I don't know how that hits you, but I know how it hits me. And Folks, if we could get a hold of just a little bit of that, that I'm the treasure that he prized. I'm what he was looking for. And he looked over this world. He looked over the field. And he looked down and Corbin, Kentucky, and London, and Barberville, and Williamsburg. And he said, there's some, there's some treasure down there. And in the middle of all the mess that you were in, he found you, even if he had to find you in the garbage. And he gave all that he had. That's who Jesus is. That's who Jesus is. And he came looking. He's the seeker. He came looking for you and me. I know that you may not think you're worth much. But the Bible said that you were made in the image of God. Did you know that you're twice his? Not just once, you're twice his. You say, what do you mean? He made you and then he bought you. He made you and then he bought you. When you were in sin, and even though he made you, but you saw all of that decayed and corrupted and then he bought you and he shed his blood. Folks, when we get over the message of Calvary and the message of the cross, we're in trouble. I want to tell you today that as they begin to play that Jesus is the seeker you may feel like you've spent a lot of your life trying a lot of stuff and most of which didn't work out too well and maybe you have maybe you're searching but I want to tell you today he came looking for you first he left heaven came looking for you bow your heads with me God, I pray I pray that you touch hearts. Lord, please help me to be sensitive to your voice this morning. (coughs) 
maybe, maybe you've been around the edges. Maybe you've had some familiarity with church or the gospel or the Lord or whatever. But maybe you've not really surrendered. He said, if you'll acknowledge me, I sure won't deny you. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, I need to come. I I thought I was looking for something, looking for Him, but all along, He's been looking for me. He's the seeker. While we were still sinners, He died for us. He was proactive. He took action first. He's the original seeker. Help me, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. If you're here today and you need to make that surrender and you need to come because He's been looking for you, you need to surrender wholly to Him. I want to ask you right now, to get out of your seat get up out of your seat and come meet me at this altar and let's pray together come on right now if you want to pray come on right now and say I, I can't believe he was looking for me all this time I need I may not understand it all but I, I need to take that step please pray with me church I want to ask you right now to get up out of your seat. Maybe there are those today that maybe you have some level of relationship with the Lord, but you're struggling. And you need to, you need to make a move toward Him today. This altar is open for you. I'm not in a hurry here. If you're having a hard time, you need to come to this altar. Find a place to pray. Very reverently, would you stand with me all over this room? Again, I'm not in a hurry here. I feel like there are some people that need to get out of your seat and come join us at this altar to pray and talk to Jesus like you talk to your best friend. You need to give Him your marriage. You need to give Him your kids. You need to give Him your life. You need to give Him your future. He's waiting for you. He's waiting for you. Come on, if you need to pray today. They'll let you out if you need out. I am not in a hurry. I'm going to linger here a minute. If you need to come make a connection with the Lord because He's been looking for you, get out of your seat. Just nudge somebody by you. Excuse me. They will let you out. Church, please pray with me. Come on, this is your time. Get out of your seat. Move toward this altar. Come stand, kneel, whatever. But I need to make a move toward Jesus today. I need to make a move toward Jesus today. I know He's been looking for me. Come on, if you want to pray. Come on, this is important. This is vital.
if you'll take one step toward him, I promise he'll take a big step toward you. I'm going to wait here just another minute. Church, pray with me. This altar's open if you want to come today. Jesus loves you, but you need to come and surrender. Come on, if you want to move toward God today. God, I'm coming bringing everything I am and everything I'm not. You left heaven, came to earth looking for me. The least I can do is step out toward an altar. Make a move toward God. Say, God, can't can't God touch me here? Yeah, but you need to make a move. You need to take a step. You need to do something that lets him know you want him. You want what he's offering. And you're not rejecting him. I'm going to wait another moment here. Pray with me, church. Come on, if you need to get out of your seat. Make a move toward God today. This altar is open for you, church. I want everybody that will as they begin to sing. Come on, make a move toward God. Come on, church, start moving into this altar. Find you a place to pray. If you'll draw near to him, he'll draw near to you. This altar's open. Come with us today. Altar workers, be sensitive and attentive. If someone needs you to pray with them this morning. So, so Don't deserve it, still you 